Welcome to Conversations, a weekly audio cast featuring interviews with leading investment strategists and recognized financial professionals. Brought to you by the Market Technicians Association. This is Conversations, the official MTA podcast series, and today's guest is Gregory Morris. Gregory Morris is Senior Vice President, Chief Technical Analyst, and Chairman of the Investment Committee for Stadium Money Management, LLC. In this capacity, Greg educates institutional and individual clients on the merits of technical analysis and why Stadium utilizes a technical rule-based model. Greg oversees the management of over $5 billion in assets in four mutual funds, separate accounts, and 401k plans. From 1996 to 2002, Greg was CEO of Murphy Morris Incorporated, the leading provider of web-based market analysis tools and commentary with his partner, John Murphy, a former CNBC analyst. Murphy Morris Incorporated was acquired by StockCharts.com in October 2002. Greg has written three books with McGraw-Hill, The Complete Guide to Market Breadth Indicators, Candlestick Charting Explained, and Candlestick Charting Explained Workbook. He is currently under contract with John Wiley for his fourth and last book. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin in 1971 with a BS degree in aerospace engineering, has authored numerous investment-related articles, speaks at numerous seminars and investment groups around the world, appeared numerous times on the Financial News Network, Fox Business, CNBC, and Bloomberg TV. Greg has been featured in Investor's Business Daily, Business Week, Barron's, Stocks and Commodities Magazine, and Bloomberg Markets. From 1971 to 1977, he was also a Navy F-4 fighter pilot aboard the USS Independence, who was selected for and graduated from the Navy Fighter Pilot Weapon School, known as Top Gun. Welcome to the program, Greg. Pleasure to be here. Well, let's start at the beginning. How did you go from Top Gun to Technical Analyst? (laughs) Well, uh, when you're at Top Gun, of course, you know everything. So I figured I could easily do make a lot of money in the markets, and uh, and I found out very quickly because I made my first investments in late '72. um, Had no plans, just bought some things I thought I liked with a small amount of money, which was a lot back then. And I rode them all the way down, 73 and 74, a very severe bear market. Had no stop losses, had no money management, had just had nothing. And uh, all all the while these were going down, the earnings got better, the dividend got bigger. Uh, you know, the fundamentals just continually improved. And I realized, I think the engineering in me kicked in and said, this is not a very good way to make money. And that's what got me interested in technical analysis. I read a book by Michael Zahorchek. Uh, the Art of Low Risk Investing in '76, I think, some, some, somewhere right in there, and it just uh, it made so much sense to me. It was basically using moving averages, advanced decline line, things like that. It was just a logical process. So that's that's what got me in, and it's been nonstop ever since. Hmm. What are your favorite technical analysis tools besides the uh, the moving averages? Things have progressed a lot since the early '70s. Well, uh, in the early 90s, uh, I developed a lot of software in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, I got very involved in indicators and trading systems and was doing all sorts of very complex models, et cetera. I had software out that supported TradeStation, Metastock, Windows on Wall Street. And what I was trying to do really was not provide trading systems and indicators, but I was trying to provide the code for people because many people don't have the ability to generate code, especially with some of the software packages that require programming language. Um, And then when I started working with John Murphy, uh, he and I had met out at FNN back in the 80s in the green room and, and became friends. And John used to always say, the best analysis is always the simple stuff. And I have to, after 40, almost 40 years, I totally agree. The simple stuff works. An indicator is there to help divine information from data. Uh, and if the indicator is as complex as the data, you might as well be looking at the raw data. So moving averages are still good. Uh, I don't do any mean reversion or use of oscillators. I, I don't think 
people know what overbought and oversold is, except in hindsight. Uh, don't, we don't do anything along on that because it cannot be explicitly defined except by using hindsight parameters. So it's, it's all trend following. MACD is good. Uh, actually, stochastics is a very good trend following indicator. Most people don't use it that way, but if you use long enough periods, it's a very good trend following indicator. So uh, yeah, the simple stuff in direct answer to your question. Hmm. How do you incorporate these into your models that you use uh, at Stadion? Because you manage over $5 billion. So I mean, this is a robust model that you use? Well, it's a, uh, well, first of all, there's three components to the model. And, and I, I tell people it's kind of like a camp stool. If you've been camping, a three-legged stool will set on just about any surface comfortably and be stable. The first leg of the stool, the first component of the model is a weight of the evidence. It's, what it is, it's a basket of technical indicators that are designed to measure trends. There are price-based indicators, and you know, a simple example, this is not one of them, a simple example is the price today higher than it was 10 days ago. Rate of change. In other words, obviously if it's higher, then you're in an uptrend for that period of time. So the, the price-based indicators, um, relative strength indicators, that's something like, and they're more confirmation-based measures. For instance, small cap relative to large cap, growth relative to value. Uh, I'm not sure where this came to me, but at some point in my career, I, I realized that up markets, uptrending markets, required speculation. And speculation to keep these markets going is, is supported by small cap participation and growth participation. And so those types of measures are more trend confirmation measures. A major part of the weight of the evidence is breadth. Uh, as, as you've said earlier, I wrote a book on breadth quite a few years ago. Uh, but, and the reason I wrote it is because everybody had dealt with breadth in their books, uh, John, Martin, Pring, et cetera, but only usually just a chapter. And I thought it was worthy of a book. Um, so breadth is... What's really unique about breadth is it's an unweighted measure of what the market is doing, like advances decline. I'm not talking advance decline line. I use it in a, you know, always in a ratio fashion of advances minus declines divided by total issues or something like that, so that it's not affected by the movement of issues in and out of an index. Mm -hmm. And probably to most people's surprise, I used the Nasdaq breadth and not the NYSE breadth. Uh, I used to use both. NYSE got very interest sensitive issues included in the in the when I think when Grasso tried to grow the exchange back there 10, 12 years ago. And it just uh, I just don't think it works as well. And also for price, we, we use the NASDAQ composite because you want a high beta index if you're measuring price because it generally goes up more and faster and it goes down more and faster and that's what you want to be able to recognize. But uh, breadth is, the, the beauty of breadth is that, especially in market tops, breadth will deteriorate long before capitalization weighted price indices will. And, and if you think about it, it's kind of logical because investors, um, whether they know they're doing it or not, if the market starts going sideways in a period of distribution, they'll start moving into what they perceive to be safer, large cap, blue chip stocks. Well, that just drives cap and weighted indices higher and, and the breadth indices decline. And so it's a very good measurement at, uh, at tops because tops are very long, drawn out affairs. So those are the three components of the weight of the evidence. In other words, all we're trying to do is measure what the market is doing. Is it going up or not? And then from that, we have a set of rules and guidelines. In other words, if the weight of the evidence is saying this, what are we supposed to do? How much percentage of equity do we want to commit? Uh, what, what our stops are going to be on our holdings, et cetera. In other words, it, it's a complete set of rules that tells exactly how to trade what the weight of the evidence is telling us. And then the third and final and just as important 
is the discipline to do this day in and day out and not question it. That was a long answer, wasn't it? Oh, that was fabulous. <laughs> I, so I, I'm, this is a follow-up question. You've said that rules and discipline are the key to using technical analysis. So yes. that, that's, the, that's two of the, the legs of the stool that you just talked about, correct? Correct. So the can so when the weight of evidence is uh, pointing, giving you a green light, let's say, one of the legs of the stool is to have the conviction to follow your model and follow your rules as the other leg. Is that that's, is that correct? You got it. That's exactly correct. So the weight of the measuring what the market's doing is one leg of the stool. That's the technical analysis. And is that mechanical or discretionary? It's mechanical. Okay. You got to get human emotion out of it. Our frail human brains are horrible at making investment decisions. I think that's the whole premise of using technical analysis to start with, is to get the human decision making out of the process. The second leg of the stool is the rules and guidelines to tell us what to do. What percentage of equity do we commit and at what time? It also tells us what the requirements are for what ETFs we buy. We, we only invest in ETFs in this example. It could be stocks. But in other words, what's an ETF have to be doing before we can buy it? In other words, it's got to be going up too, so we're measuring it based on technicals. And then the third leg of the stool is the discipline to do this. Uh, there's going to be periods as a trend follower where the markets go sideways and just beat the tar out of you. Uh, it's a fact of life. Uh, what problem is, is most people uh, with not a lot of experience will abandon their, their trend-following model that has served them well for many, many times, and they'll abandon it and go looking for something else. And they're probably going to abandon it just at about the time it starts to work again. <laughs> and it's... It's just uh, it's just like clockwork. It just seems to happen all the time. So that's where experience comes in. You so know how do you that the keep your conviction? Pardon? During, how do you keep your conviction during those sideways markets? Well, you know they're not going to be sideways forever. The markets uh, in this book I'm writing, I've, I've got quantitative evidence that markets trend 75 to 80 percent of the time. Um, I don't. I also don't believe in forecasting. And uh, when I say something like that, the market's trend 75 or 80 percent of the time. All you have is an expectation that that's going to continue like that. You have no proof. Um, when the markets start in a sideways pattern, uh, you know, some people say, "Well, what if this continues forever?" And I say, "Well, we're, we're doomed. <laughs> you know, trend falling just isn't going to make it if that if that's the case. But it never has in 130 years. So." I think the, the statistically it shows that uh, the markets are going to resume their trending phase. And if you think about it, trends are caused by investor psychology. Um, investors who are buying stocks in the market know while the market's trending up they're going to have to pay a higher price. And sellers know they can get a higher price, and that's what causes trends. And then eventually that psychology rolls over and it works in the opposite direction. Well, tell me more about this book you're writing. What's, does it have a name? Well, we expect it. What is the premise the, the, of the, the book? The name of it is going to be called Dancing with the Trend. So you can kind of guess it's about a rules-based trend-following model. But it's, it's also probably two-thirds of it is is – about why you use trend following in a model. In other words, it's things I've learned over the last 40 years. Uh, I'm very critical of modern finance. Um, I'm sure before the book's published, I'll have to tone a lot of that down. I don't want to offend everybody. <laughs> but I think modern finance is just almost a hoax. Um, there are times when it works, but the throwing darts at, a, at the Wall Street Journal will work also in a good cyclical bull market. So um, I've, I've, I show a lot of data. I, I've developed a technique to actually quantify and measure trends in markets. And so I've got a lot of tables and charts to show how trending is identified and how it works. 
Uh, I spend a lot of time on risk. Uh, the world of finance wants you to think that volatility based upon standard deviation is risk. I think that's just hogwash, drawdown, bear markets, serious loss of capital. That's what you're, that's what people think risk is, not uh, the world of finance. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I just kind of put it together and explain how models work, how you can build a weight of the evidence model, um, how you can develop rules to, to follow the model, follow the weight of the evidence. And I talk a lot about the discipline. Um, and I, I spend a lot of time on behavioral biases, um, cogn cognitive dissonance, um, overconfidence. Um, you know, it's, so it's just it's just a... I say at the beginning of the book, I said, this is not a storybook. This is a compilation of four decades of just being involved in the markets. And I've got very strong opinions about it, and I, I, you know, I just state that up front. But I also say that technical analysis is an art form. And when you're dealing with an art form, you absolutely cannot speak in absolutes. That was supposed to be funny. I got it. <laughs> I didn't want to. I don't want to take the floor from you. <laughs> All right. yeah, so when can out, the book will be out next summer? It's uh, yeah, probably probably summer. Summer twenty thirteen. Okay. Yeah. And it will be the last one. <laughs> Do they take a lot out of you? Well, I I don't have I won't have anything to say after this one. Uh, the candlestick books were, were came because I was a software developer back in the 80s and developed candlestick pattern identification software. So that's where those books came from. The breadth was just kind of a – what drove me on breadth was because I used it a lot and there wasn't any real good source for all the breadth data. And so that's what caused the breadth book to come about. Um, it doesn't sell very well because, first of all, technical analysis is a fairly vertical market. And then – you get into a very specific slice of technical analysis, you've gotten it even more vertical. Uh, so I, I think everybody that was interested bought the book, and that's probably going to be it. So this book's much broader, um, much broader based, and it, and that's more in line with actually doing technical analysis and money management. What is your favorite market book that you didn't write? Um, well, they've changed over the years, obviously. I think the single best book on technical analysis today, in other words, what I call the big books on technical analysis, the one by Charlie Kirkpatrick and Julie Dahlquist. Um, and I say that because it's a, it's a little more involved than John Murphy and Martin Prings, which are both also very good books when we're talking about the big books on technical analysis. Mm -hmm. And I think Charlie's got Charlie's book is just a, it's just a little more involved, and it's more about he, he deals with the why uh, as much as he deals with the how, which a lot of times the why part is missing in a lot of books. Um, and that's the, yeah, I'd have to just stick with Charlie's. I mean, I, I think I've read them all. I've got a huge library of PA books. Um, you know, I I I even read the. The books that when I buy them, I think, you know, this is probably just hocus pocus. Um, and because sometimes a guy might have a very unique, great idea, he just doesn't know how to take it to fruition. And he, and he gets off track in his book, but boy, if I, if I can read, if I can buy a book and get one great idea out of it, it's worth the cost of the book. Mm -hmm. You found so, a few nuggets. The, just there's nuggets hidden in there, and I don't think the authors sometimes know that they're nuggets. <laughs> it's just something he's <laughs> believed in or something. So, mm -hmm. Well, I know you don't like to forecast, but uh, maybe you can tell me what your model is showing today. And if you want to hazard a forecast, that's fine too. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, it's uh, the model uh, has in the, in, in the last – week rolled over and uh, we are we are back almost uh, in a heavy cash position we treat cash as an asset class we're long only we don't play the short side so that explains that but we we when the when our model rolls over that tightens the stops on our holdings and and many of the, the holdings have been sold here in the last few days um, now now 
based upon that, uh, it's saying that there was a lot of weakness based upon the trends of the market. So we, we just we follow the model because I honestly don't think anyone knows how the market's going to close today, let alone any time in the future. Um, that's because this is an art form. And there, of course, there's the, the financial media is parading experts across the screen all day long, but not one of them will put their life on their forecast. Uh, and I, I, the reason I say it like that, it sounds kind of harsh, is when you're dealing with somebody's retirement account, you, you're dealing with all they've got. And you, you can't be making investment decisions based on someone's guess about what's going to happen into the future. And that's why, that's why we just measure what the market's doing, follow the rules, and do it day in and day out. In other words, we're very defensive. Um, so I, I won't give a forecast because I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have long-term views of the markets. I believe we're in a secular bear market. We are nearing the end of a cyclical bull market. Um, the secular bear will end when valuations get down around single digits, and that doesn't mean that the prices have to go as low as they did in March of 2009 because the numerator can get smaller, but the denominator can get larger. The earnings can improve also, which will get low valuations, and then we'll go into another sec secular bull market like we had in the 80s and 90s, but that, that could be four or five years away. Now, having said that, that's just kind of my big dynamic view on how where we are and how I think it'll play out but it has nothing to do with what I do with investing mm -hmm. in other words I don't that's observable information versus actionable information does that make sense yes yeah well we are out of time is there anything you would like to add before we go dance with the trend <laughs> Well, I'd love to have you back on when your book comes out next year. I'd be honored. Today's guest has been Gregory Morris, and that concludes today's MTA podcast from LexingtonCapitalLLC.com. I'm Lance McDonald, together with recording engineer Shane Squarek at the MTA, reminding you that price is always right. <laughs>